and good afternoon. Good afternoon. One second. This is okay. That's now the sun's not in my eyes. Okay. We're not quite to the start time yet, so we're just gonna hang loose uh, for a couple of minutes. Make sure that if there's any last minute comers in that they are uh, here. And that's how things are gonna work with us. So the scheduled start time for classes at this university is 10 minutes after the hour. So uh, we'll, we'll get started right at 10 minutes. And uh, so that folks can uh, roll in as they need to. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I'm Reed Krell, and I assume that you're all here for torts. Uh, if you're not, well, uh, the good news is that this doesn't have to be awkward. You can just quietly step out. Okay. With that in mind, uh, let me start by showing you a few things. So. say that. There it is. All right. So as you can see, this is the e-learning site for uh, our class. Um, I've put some things up here for you that I would like to draw your attention to. So the first one is the syllabus, right? So we've provided the syllabus. It gives you an understanding of the policies and the uh, things that we're going to be doing uh, over the course of the semester. Um, and it's a dynamic link to my OneDrive. So if I update the syllabus, it automatically, the, the link will automatically go to the updated version. So if I tell you that there's been a change to the syllabus, uh, you can still follow that same link and it will take you to the up-to-date syllabus. This next link is the uh, link to my lecture notes. So um, every semester students go, can you give us slide decks? And every semester I say, no, I can't um, because I don't use PowerPoint. 
I don't use PowerPoint to teach. Um, instead, what I do is I uh, build out my notes to sort of give me an understanding of what I want to talk through, right? And to give me the flexibility to jump around based on what you guys ask for or need. Um, and I give you guys access to those notes. So here they are, right? You can see that here I am talking about syllabus and the link to this to, to these lecture notes. And if you look at this, you can kind of see where we're going to be over the course of the day, okay? Um, the next thing here is a survey that I'd like you guys to fill out and you can do it right now, you know, if you don't feel the need to listen to me blather. Um, but it's just intended to help me understand sort of what your technical capacity is in terms of what, uh, you know, what your hardware will allow you to do, what you, what kind of internet connection you have, how you expect to access resources for this class. Um, because the idea is that a difficulty in getting your hands on the appropriate resources should not keep you from succeeding in the class. So for example, if lots of folks are going to have problems getting their hands on the textbook, then I may go into campus and scan some or all of the assigned readings so that you can, uh, so that I can post them on e-learning so that you can have them, right? If there's going to be significant bandwidth issues that makes it difficult for you to uh, watch videos, right? I'm going to not use those as learning resources in the same way that I might if everybody's on Cave Hill and everybody has access to uh, high-speed broadband internet. Um, so please fill out that survey so that I have an understanding of what your technical needs are. Um, the next link is a link to my uh, virtual office. So for those of you who are not uh, in Barbados, um, if you want to meet with me, uh, this is a space where you can meet with me. It, it is using a website called gather.town. What it does is it creates a virtual space where you can have private video conferencing with multiple people, just like this Zoom, but who you see and hear depends on your proximity to them. So it creates this simulated space for you to move through and you can only see or hear the people that you're close to. So it allows you to meet with me, it allows you to meet with each other, it allows me to meet with different students in succession and have those meetings be private. So. And it doesn't require me to set up any sort of conferencing like with a Zoom, okay? So this is, this is a, a really fantastic space. I would encourage you to make use of it yourselves for study groups or whatnot. It's available 24 seven. Just click on the link and you can go there. And finally, uh, there's a document right here that sort of gives you um, the links for, for the Zooms for these lectures and for all of your tutorials. Um, uh, <laughs> please don't click on the Zoom links when it's not time for class, because then I get an email saying so-and-so has joined your Zoom. And it's just, it's another thing in my inbox. Um, not a big deal if you do it, but please don't, right? Just so you know that this is a thing. Um, okay. Then we have this week's stuff, right? So I've put a survey up here and this is one of the things that you're going to do in tutorials this week. I know that a lot of professors in the faculty of law don't even have tutorials meet during the first week of teaching. And I understand why they do that. I don't do that because I make use of that time for getting to know you guys and for you to get to know me. Okay, so the idea is that we're going to get together during tutorials this week. So that that hour of your life that you are scheduled is now booked, um, but uh, we're not gonna be doing anything, any course material, we're just going to be sort of getting to know one another, okay? And then the, the first worksheet here uh, is posted. I've gotten a couple of emails 
generated by OneDrive where students are asking for access to the worksheet. And I'm a little confused by those emails. When you click, and, and it's, it's hard for me to figure out what's going on because when I click the link, um, it logs me into my OneDrive and I get the file. Uh, but I'm curious what you guys see when you click the link. Can you see the worksheet uh, or are you, are you being denied access altogether? Um, I see that someone has answered this in the chat. I'm, I've got, this is everything that I've got here. So, um, okay. When you click the syllabus link, it shows all the worksheets. Huh, okay. I will look into that, Colleen, because that's not how it's supposed. It may be, ah, this link is only available to internal users. So what that means is that you have to log in to your Cave Hill account to access it. Um, okay, the, the syllabus is a, that's, a, that's something that I need to fix for you guys. So, okay. Yeah, uh, the putting documents in through OneDrive, that's, that's a new one. Um, I will see what I can figure, I will see what we can do. Giuseppe, we're, we're gonna deal with it and, it and that is not going to continue to be true. So, um, so thank you guys very much, but, but that's not going to continue to be true. So um, we'll, we'll deal with that uh, once class is over. Okay, so, all right. So as you can tell from listening to me, I'm not from around here, right? I'm, uh, I'm an American. Um, I was trained in the United States. I practiced in the United States and, um, and that's where a lot of my experience and expertise is. Let me go ahead and tell you this. You will not be learning American law in this class. You will be learning Caribbean law, um, to the extent that it's relevant, which, uh, as near as I can tell, it sometimes is, you'll also be learning English law. Um, there may be a time or two where I will point out that the United States does things differently in order to stimulate a conversation about um, which system sort of takes the better approach. Um, but for the most part, this is not a class about comparative law. This is not a class about American law. This is intended to train you for practice in the region. And so that's what we're gonna do. Um, in terms of teaching style, uh, I can't really speak to how my colleagues operate. Um, so I don't know if, if this is different from how they operate, but this is how I operate. I do provide some lecturing, right? I do sort of stand and, and deliver, right? What, uh, what the pedagogists refer to as a sage on the stage approach, right? That's what I'm doing now. Um, but I also use some Socratic work in our lecture period. So you should be prepared to answer questions on the material, right? I may say, okay, uh, tell me about this case. What are the facts? Or I may say, you know, what's the rule that governs this type of situation? Okay. <clears throat> and you should be prepared to answer those questions. Um, if I have to, I will implement an on-call system where uh, students are there's a, a, a group of students on any given day who are expected to answer questions. Um, but I'm hoping I won't have to do that. I'm hoping that folks will come to class and be prepared and be engaged. Um, so, uh, um, 
nobody is waiting to get in. There's no waiting room for, for the lecture. If they're in a waiting room, they're in the wrong Zoom. So, um, yeah. Okay, so all of this so far has been administrative. Um, thank you for passing that along, Christiane. Um, all of this has been administrative. Do you have any questions about the administrative stuff? Questions about administrative stuff. Going once, going twice. Okay. Linrick, you've, co you've come off mute. Do you have something? Uh, what would you classify as administrative? Oh. Uh, anything that's not course material. Ah, so if I ask something that's partially related to course material, but not directly asking about course material, how would that work? Uh, well, ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking uh, what, what exactly would you want us to focus on? What, what are the most important aspects for us to focus on um, with this course? Um, Not necessarily coursework. I mean, I just mean in yeah, general yeah, yeah. skills. That we, yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's what I what I would tell you, and this is sort of my my broad stance on how I approach um, assessing assessing students in law. Um, because I'm not I'm not a law academic, right? I I have a law degree. I was a practicing lawyer but my academic training is in political science, okay? Um, so, so I've taught in that other discipline is why I say this is how I evaluate law students. Um, I'm not super concerned about um, cases and authorities. Um, Um, I'm not concerned about cases and authorities because my stance is that any uh, issue that you have that uh, turns on cases and authorities, you're going to be able to research the authorities, okay? For the kinds of assessments that we do in uh at the university in, in this law school environment, these are much more about um, these are these are about being um, able to take a story that a client has told you and to find the things that need to be examined. Right, so being able to determine, okay, um, for example, you guys are, are have had um, criminal law, okay, criminal law one. Um, when a client comes to you and being a, and tells you a story of this is what happened, being able to identify, okay, these are the elements that the state has to prove, and this is the evidence that proves element one, this is the evidence that proves element two, this is the evidence that proves element three, okay? Not really concerned, I'm less concerned about you knowing this is the case where the House of Lords said that this evidence meets the, the requirement of element one. And this is the case where the uh, High Court of Trinidad and Tobago said that this evidence meets the, the requirement of element two, right? So does that, 
or does that answer your question? Do you feel like you have a better grip on, on what I'm looking for now? Yes, sir. Okay. So there's a question that was sent to me privately. Will you be posting on L2? I registered for L2 and not L1. Um, the answer to that is I will not be posting on L2, but for e-learning purposes, they are the same course and everybody who's in L2 has been enrolled in L1. So you can, you'll be able to get everything through L1. It'll all be there for you. Um, there's no difference in them uh, in, the, in the courses, but I'm only going to post an L1 um, in, a, in an attempt to try and uh, cut back on, on um, the workload. Because I, th I don't think, um, I think it's hard to understand just sort of how much effort goes into. And the, the next question that comes in is, should I drop L2? And the answer is no, because that's what gets you into L1. Okay, I, I just, the, this is what the, the Moodle calls this a, a meta course. Okay, and what it means is that um, all of the students in L2 are enrolled in L1, but uh, the students in L1 are not enrolled in L2. Okay, so, so don't drop, <laughs> don't drop the course. Um, you're still enrolled through that code, but for e-learning purposes, everything will be on L1, okay? Um, another private question, will all of the lectures be recorded? Yes, every, every Zoom that we have will be recorded um, and I will post it to my YouTube channel once a week. So once a week, I'll go through and post uh, and, and upload the recordings to, to YouTube can go back and review them at your leisure. So they won't be immediately available, but they will be available uh, fairly soon thereafter. Uh, the link to the YouTube channel is in the Zoom links document on e-learning. So, okay. Any other, any other administrative questions? Tutorials will be recorded as well. So you don't, you don't get to act a fool in tutorials and not have it show up on YouTube. That, that was a joke, you can laugh. So, um, okay. So uh, what other, any other questions? So there's a, a question been sent to me privately. Is there a big difference between the fourth edition and the fifth edition of the Codolini text? And the answer to that is, I don't know. Um, the uh, fifth edition came out in 2015 and the fourth edition came out in 2009. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's a difference, um, uh, if there's significant differences. Um, and I also don't know, like, to the extent that there are differences, um, do they matter for this course or do they matter more for torts too, right? Um, so I, I, the best advice that I can give you is that the fifth edition is the edition for this class. Um, but my guess is that the odds are pretty good that the fourth edition will give you most of what you need. So if you're willing to sort of run that risk, you can probably save some money, but it's not something that I can recommend. Okay, so I, I hope that answers the question that came to me privately. Another private question, would we have to turn our cameras on for lectures and tutorials? So here is my policy. I always want you to turn on your camera, okay? There is nothing worse for a teacher than teaching into the void, okay? But, but 
I get that there's a lot going on here, okay? You may have bandwidth issues that make uh, the video feed unsustainable. You may have a noisy, distracting environment, okay? Um, so I get that there's other things going on. If you choose not to turn on your camera, you're not gonna, I, I get it. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, but if you ask me what I want, I always want to see your smiling faces, okay? And your frowning faces and your barely awake faces, faces for those of you who are enrolled in the uh, Monday 8 a.m. tutorial. Um, <laughs> Any, any other administrative questions? Going once. Going once, going twice. Lynn, are you talking or? Go well, ahead. You just mentioned a Monday 8 a.m. tutorial, but when I was trying to register, I wasn't able to add it. I thought that it had been removed. Well, uh, well, that certainly explains why <laughs> that, that was actually a joke, an inside joke for myself because um, uh, no one's enrolled in it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so, so okay. I, I thought that it was, a, it was a marvel of collective action that every last one of you had looked at it and gone, nope. <laughs> no, that's not so, the case. <laughs> so, um, so uh, the, the answer to your question is I don't have any control over uh, Cave Hill Online. If there's some sort of uh, problem with that that's preventing uh, you from enrolling in it, I, I, you know, I don't have any control over that. Um, what I will tell you guys is uh, if you want to... Um, if you want that 8 a.m. Monday tutorial, uh, go ahead and attend whatever tutorial you're enrolled in for this week, but also reach out to, uh, to SITS um, and ask, you know, sort of what needs to be done to correct that uh, so that you can get into the tutorial you want starting next week. But I do want to talk to all of you in tutorials this week. And because that one has already passed, please do attend the, the one that you're already enrolled in. Okay. Um, so that's just for this week. Next week, once we get that sorted out through SITS, uh, you will we'll meet at the Monday 8 a.m. for those that want that. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let's start. Oh, looks like there was, okay. Um, let's, uh, somebody off mute, is someone, was there a question? Yes, Lingwood, I, I just wanted to- Oh, you're, I can barely hear you. Oh, okay, maybe me. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I've turned I've turned my volume up quite a bit as well. So let's. Right. Okay, I just wanted to um, language voice. Uh, I just wanted to say I also tried to um, register for that particular time slot. So, um, but I, like you, your your advice, I would take your advice, and um, I would prefer that time slot. So I would, um, I believe, many of the other uh, of the others. Sure. Yeah. I'm, no, it's it's on the timetable. It's available yeah. to you. The fact yeah. that there's some sort of issue, I, I'm not taking it away. I'm just saying okay. for this week so that I can make sure that I've had a chance to talk to all of you. Um, 
please attend whatever alternative one you are you are right currently registered for. Yeah. So yeah. you are saying that you're available for that year to nine. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. Okay. So let's start talking about torts, right? And you know the the first chapter of the book and the the sort of idea behind this week's lectures is what is the purpose of torts, right? Why, why do we study torts? Okay, and, and there's a lot of different sort of explanations, right? The textbook says that the purpose of torts is to compensate persons harmed by the wrongful conduct of others, right? And if you, you go and you ask the, the folks in Chicago, the, the law and economics people, They'll tell you that you know the purpose of torts is to efficiently allocate the burden of harm based on on moral judgments, right? But what do you guys think is the purpose of tort law? Barry says to um, fix I, the civil wrong. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, I would say to provide a remedy in cases that are not um, classified as criminal. And of course, you know, where compensation should be awarded um, for damage is done as it is assessed for that to be achieved. So, I'm sorry, Derek, say that again a little slower. So sometimes, sometimes I have to, I'm sorry, sometimes I have to sort of sit in and think through words as they're said. So say, say it again. Right, this is not a theoretical answer. It's just um, it is to basically reward persons um, for damages in cases where, that, cases that are not classified as criminal, you know, where there's not like a criminal penalty to be allocated, but at the same time, there's a need, you know, where the law feels that, you know, there should be some punishment allocated and that punishment can be in the form of maybe like a financial reward or other type of reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I think there's some, some good things there, right? And, and, you know, Derek's touching on, you know, things aren't, uh, you know, that it's not criminal, it's not, uh, you know, that it's about, damages for harm, right? That sort of thing. And um, the things I'm seeing in the chat are all sort of hitting in the same the same notes. And, and I think that you're all sort of getting on the right track. Um, the, uh, to sort of pull back a little bit and give you a sort of a broader view for, for just a second, right? There's some private law theorists who talk about um, private law, and by private law, I mean uh, contracts, torts, and property. So the, the civil law uh, categories that um, don't involve the state, right? Uh, they talk about it as a law of relationships, right? It's a law that is intended to govern the relationship between the parties, Right, so in contracts, you have the relationship that is mediated through an agreement, right? In property, you have the relationship that is mediated through some sort of object, right? It's, it's something that is owned, and that, that's, how it, it, uh, that's how the relationship comes into existence. In torts, the relationship is driven by an event, okay? So torts is the law of events relationships. And you're all absolutely right that the events that we're interested in are events where somebody did something wrong, right? To sort of draw on the most recent uh, uh, message that was sent to me privately, right? Uh, so somebody did something wrong and it harmed someone. Okay, because as the book points out, you can do something wrong and you get lucky and nobody gets hurt, right? Um, you, you may 
uh, drive drunk, right? And you get all the way home and you don't hit anything or anybody and great, you got lucky, right? So uh, the, you know, the book calls that damnum sine injuria, right? Wrong without injury. Um, or, right, something, you know, everything can go right and somebody still gets hurt. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have an, an example of that just sort of off the top of my head, but we all can think of, you know, nobody did anything wrong, just the world conspired to hurt you. And the, the book calls that injuria sine damno, right? Injury without wrong. Um, so we're going to talk about a, a message asks about the neighbor principle, and we're going to talk about the neighbor principle over the course of the class, but we're not there yet. Um, so yeah, right. There are plenty of car wrecks where nobody does anything wrong. It just happens, right? Um, you know, particularly if weather conditions are are poor and you know, you've done, you've taken all of the care that you can reasonably take and you, it, but it's not enough. Um, okay. So, What are the things that make tort law stand out different from criminal law? Okay, so someone says privately and, and let me let me throw out here the, the notion that it's going to be, if you want to use the chat, it's going to be helpful to you to make sure that you are uh, sending your messages to everyone rather than uh, just to me. Okay. So that that's, it's not a big deal, but it's just a, a thing to keep in mind. So um, do you think that a person might shoot you without being I'm sorry, say that again, Colette. No, sorry about that. That's on my TV. Okay. Um, criminal law is about, it's a public wrong and it is administered by, it is, it is a public punishment for wrongdoers. Right. Criminal right. law protects the public. Um, tort law, no, is a civil wrong, it, it, it gives uh, um, compensation for damages. Um, so if the, let's suppose that um, in a criminal proceeding, the punishment is a fine. Okay, so there's no, there's no custodial punishment available. It's just, you know, if you are found guilty, you pay a fine. How is that different from uh, tort law in terms of how it treats the defendant? In tort law, um, it is suggesting that it is to put back the, the victim in a place where he was before the harm was caused. In other words, like you just said, it's not just to pay a fine because that fine may not justify uh, the person where they were before, All right? For example, you were walking, a guy eat drunk and came and knocked you down, All right? Before that, you didn't have any hospital bills, you weren't crippled, none of those things. What tort law is doing is it, it is gonna justify the fine in such a way that you were not, uh, had, had to suffer in the first instance. So, so it's not just a fine, but it must justify uh, the cause to where you were before. And I think that's the significance. It must be justifiable to bring you back, to put the person back in a position uh, where they were before the harm was caused. 
Yeah, and, yeah. and by the way, what I'm seeing in the chat is all absolutely great and absolutely right, right? I think that, that these are, are really good um, things that you guys are coming up with on the, uh, in the, as far as the difference between criminal law and tort law, right? And, and Rudolph, you're absolutely right that, um, that what we are, you know, that what you're, you're dealing with is two different things, right? So think about it, in criminal law, um, even if the punishment is a fine, who decides what the appropriate punishment for a crime is? Right, 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 right. Well, who, who does? The law. Nope. Not the judge. Because the judge, the, the judge is, is drawing on a source of law. Where does that source of law come from? It's the state, the legislature. Exactly, right? The legislature determines what the appropriate punishment for a crime is, right? The, the representatives of the people. Um, okay, so these are, so that's, um, so that, that's a really important difference is that the, uh, the cost of crime is knowable. Right, you can know this is what I'm going to to suffer if I am punished for this crime. Whereas, with tort law, as Rudolph points out, the point of damages in tort is to make whole the victim, and that may be a massive, massive cost. Right, particularly if you know, for example, in the example that that Rudolph offers. You know, you hit a pedestrian with your car, and they have significant uh, medical costs, and they lose uh, their ability to work for a period of time, or perhaps for the rest of their life. Right? Um, you know, there's uh, compensation for the pain and suffering that someone goes through. Right? Uh, there may be compensation for strain on their spousal relationships. Right? That's um, something that's referred to as loss of consortium. Um, you know, these are, are all um, things that can sort of add to the bill in tort law. So you're not going to go to prison over a tort, but your scope of, you know, the scope of, of exposure can, can be significantly broader in a, in a monetary sense. Okay, so Alana points out that torts can be unintentional, whereas criminal law is usually intentional. Um, certainly, there are crimes that have uh, lowered mens rea components, um, but you're absolutely right that most of the time, uh, criminal law does impose some sort of requirement that the state prove that you intended to act. Okay, they don't necessarily have to prove that you intended to do the thing that you did, but they do have to prove that you, you acted intentionally. Whereas we're gonna spend most of our semester talking about negligence, which is a type of case where you didn't intend this at all, right? So towards the end of the semester, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, one category of intentional torts, but the vast majority of what we do in this class will be related to the tort of negligence. Okay, so um, we're almost done. I just have one more thing that I want to talk about, and then we'll we'll call it a day. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, right? So, so the other sort of area of law that torts is often related to is contracts. And Oliver Wendell Holmes said that a contract was just a promise to pay damages in the event of breach, right? Con he, he said that contracts don't actually create an obligation to perform. They just create an obligation to either perform or pay, okay? Oh, sir, can you repeat that please? Sure, sure, absolutely. So the statement from Holmes is that a contract is nothing but a promise to pay damages in the event of breach. So 
when you guys take contracts, right, you'll take it this semester with Ms. Hamilton, you'll take it uh, in semester one next year with um, Ms. Lancaster, assuming that uh, that the dean doesn't doesn't rearrange things. Um, but uh, one of the things that you will learn is that contracts create obligations. Okay, and Holmes's point is that no, they actually don't. What they do is they create a choice. You can either perform what you have promised to perform under the contract, or you can pay what you've promised to pay for not performing, right? But there's no, there's no obligation to do something here. You have a choice, okay? So does that, does that clarify what we're, what I'm, what I've said? Because all of this is build up. I'm, I'm leading to something. So do we, do we understand this so far? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so some folks have taken this, this idea of Justice Holmes, and they've extended it, and they've said, well, really, all that's happening is that contracts create an agreement that certain conduct is tortious. Okay, so, so it's basically like an agreement that this is what we're going to do for one another, and if we don't do it, then we have, we have breached a duty, okay? Um, what do we think about that? Do we think that um, do we think that contracts are just a another form of torts, or do we think that there's actually something unique to these two areas of law? Do we think that there's a difference? Yeah, yes, there's a there's a major difference in that the contract is a consensus between the parties, whereas tort would not be. You follow? So, so if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that the existence of the agreement is the fundamental difference, that the contract does not represent an agreement to impose a duty on one another, but rather it has its own independent existence. That's it, yeah, yeah. I think that's a I think that's a reasonable argument. Does anybody want to make the argument for the other side that the agreement is actually just a an imposition of a duty um, and doesn't have an independent existence? Jade, go ahead. But if you think about it, um, contract isn't basically like a written or binding agreement on the parties to say that their actions, if they breach it, would be tortured. So in a sense, it would be a subset of tort, not necessarily like a completely separate form of tort. Right, that's, that's the argument basically, right? Is that, um, is that the parties have agreed that if you do X, Y, and Z, okay? Where, where X, Y, and Z are breaching the contract, we agree that that commit that that is a tort between us, okay. But um, do you think that this is a meaningful distinction at all? I mean, I, I think that it I I think that it is reasonable to argue that this is all just so much hair splitting, right? That the there's not really a difference here. How do you explain, sir? Like for example, remember in tort, this is which is a private, this is private. You, you cause me harm, and as a result, you're supposed to compensate me for the harm you cause no. me. Just the two in, in a contractual agreement. <laughs> in a contractual one, agreement. Se one second, one second. Go ahead, Rudolph. I'm sorry. In a contractual agreement. You and I, you, you decide to sell me a car, mm -hmm. and um, I, uh, you offer, I accept. There's intention, and in a sense, we have a contract. I, my, my thing is that, and, and there are two different things, because one, one is based on you and I coming together and forming a kind of relationship, uh, which is based on offer and acceptance. On the other hand, um. 
from the thought perspective, I see that there was no relationship uh, between us until you caused me harm. And, and that's where I, that's where I have my difference. Uh, what, what, what one came about because of an agreement to offer an acceptance, and then it was it only existed when you caused when you caused the victim harm. I agree. Uh, I agree. Go ahead, my, uh, Michael. Go ahead. Um, my thing is that the way that Rudolph is explaining it. it, it Suggest that tort only comes into play after harm has been done, but would a tort be necessarily like, um, in the terms of the preventative measure, like, um, like to assume that we all have a duty of care to each other, and therefore to make sure that we all know that if this particular thing happens, you can be compensated on the tort, right? And then the contractual agreement now, um, for example, if you want to buy the same car, suppose the person was selling the person a faulty car they have a duty to make sure that the car is in a good um state to be sold so i do i don't necessarily think that what rudolph is saying um is right in inverted commas because i think court that the tort acts as um for people to know that okay we have a duty of care and so, not necessarily um that it only comes into play afterward so i think I michael so i think michael raises a really important point in that a significant portion of the actual practice of lawyers who sort of deal with torts on a day in day out basis isn't actually litigation over whether a tort has occurred. It's risk management, right? It's about preventing torts to begin with. It's about making sure that you're complying with the duty of care or that your clients are complying with the duty of care, okay? And so Michael's absolutely right that the relationship that torts envisions actually exists before the harm occurs, because if the relationship didn't exist, then we would have, you know, we would have, there would be no duty of care, and we'd have that injuria sine damno, right, the injury without wrong, okay, um, but Rudolph is right, in that um, the duty of care is this sort of very free-floating amorphous thing that you neither consent to nor accept, right? You don't, there's, he's, he's absolutely right that the offer and acceptance are really key components of, of the contract, okay? As you'll see as you, as you continue on the semester with Ms. Hamilton. Um, but I think, you know, I think that there are connections between these that we can make while still recognizing that they are distinct. And, and as Jade pointed out a few minutes ago, that maybe contracts are a subset of torts, but they're not, um, but they're not, uh, by, but there's not by any stretch of the imagination like a a significant overlap between the two, right? I think the Mars point here in the chat is also helpful that uh, contracts create an assumption of a duty, whereas torts are about the duties that are placed on you by just by virtue of living in a society, okay? Um, and, you know, when we talk about causation and remoteness uh, a little later on in the semester, We'll sort of talk about what the boundaries of that duty is and who you owe it to and sort of how far it extends. So, um, okay, we are out of time. I wanna tell you guys, I really appreciate uh, the engagement that I've gotten from you guys and how, how enthusiastic you are. This is a really, um, I'm really excited to, to see that and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing on in that, in that manner throughout the semester. So uh, we've got a couple of tutorials scheduled for tomorrow. Um, if you're in them, I'll see you tomorrow. If uh, not, I'll see you later in the week. So, all right, with, with that, I'm going to let you guys go and uh, we'll take this up uh, later. So take care and bye. Bye. Bye.